want to start with this question with respect to like where we are in the trajectory of crypto, because I feel like you've played a pretty key role in, in preaching, let's, let's call it the good word of crypto to traditional investors. Um, I don't know how you're feeling these days, 2024. Are you feeling still feeling like a prophet in the wilderness, like evangelizing to people who thought you were crazy? Like, how does it feel this time around? In some ways, I, I, I almost feel like, you know, my mission or my contribution is 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 getting long in the tooth. Yeah. In that, you know, how many times can I hear the same bald headed guy tell the Bitcoin <laughs> story or tell the prospect of the promise of crypto? Um, we're at the launching pad. You know, I started this expression, the herd is coming, and I was about five years, six years, seven years too early. They're here. You know, we've had the first ETF with Bitcoin. Now we've got the Ethereum ETF. Uh, we have a huge change of heart around the politics of crypto. I mean, this Bitcoin national conference is going to be electric. Mm. Uh, Donald Trump is the great opportunist who says, <laughs> hey, there are 10 million single issue voters. I want them. Yeah. And so there is rumor he is going to announce a strategic reserve for Bitcoin. Uh, I think that would make the price go significantly higher. What? Like, it, who would have thought in the wildest dreams? Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, listen, I don't know if he will. I haven't seen his speech. I know Kennedy is speaking before him. He's very pro crypto. It's an all star lineup out there. I know Cynthia Lummis is giving a speech and there's potential that she's going to prop something in her bill. And so you could see this build on it. Um, and I would, I could, I would also tell you that the Democrat, it, the Democratic presumptive nominee, Kamala Harris and her people are saying, wait a minute, I can't not be, you know, she's from San Francisco. She understands the benefit of tech. In, in, in terms of growth. And so I am very certain the Dems are gonna make a big pivot on saying, hey, the Biden administration was wrong on this. Uh, let's dump Gary Gensler. Uh, let's be tech and innovation forward. And so all of a sudden we've got two parties that are gonna start fighting over us pariahs. And it's pretty freaking exciting. And so, you know, it'll be interesting. You could do a second podcast next week to see if all this plays out, but, it's got the market really excited. And I think, listen, if Trump announces it, it's a game changer. Prices are a lot higher. Uh, you know, then there's a, call it a 45, 55% chance he wins right now, or call it 50-50. And then if he wins, does he follow through? Probably 80%. But if he follows through, there's probably an 80% chance other banks, central banks and reserves start buying it. And all of a sudden, what we thought was kind of fun to talk about, 500,000, 600,000, 700,000 crypto actually is in the realm of possibility. And, you know, 700,000 crypto is gold. It's roughly the market cap of gold, uh, right? 14 trillion, something around there. Maybe gold's a little higher now because gold price went up. But like that seemed like fantasy. And now there is a, it's not base case, but it's a possibility. And so that's pretty freaking exciting. It's crazy and how quickly it's all happened. And I, I do want to get back to politics and, and the 2024 election because that seems to be be a catalyst. But what you're just talking about is there's the potential. This, this episode will, will go out on Monday of next week, Mike. We're recording this on a Wednesday, the 24th. So it goes out uh, on Monday, the 29th. <laughs> so I'm either going to look prophetic or foolish. Exactly, which is the perfect place to be. That's the line you want to like kind of like balance, I, I think. So prophetic uh, and foolish, which is maybe maybe that's a summary of your crypto evangelism. <laughs> but it's been more <laughs> prophetic than it has been foolish. And so like I want to ask, so we're talking about the potential of a major um, political, like potentially the next president of the United States uh, announcing a strategic Bitcoin reserve. Okay. That's what you were just talking about. And you were talking about how there. bullish that would be. Okay. So coming back to that, but like when you said the herd was coming, like back in 2017, I, I recall you, you, you saying that, uh, is that what you meant? Do you think the herd would actually be central banks? Cause I, I got the impression you were more talking about like whales and TradFi and like institutional I was, I was investors. I was talking about the Black Rocks. And yeah. Listen, I think the single most important thing that's happened to crypto in the last two years is Larry Fink being orange pilled. And, you know, it wasn't just one person, one person led it. It was a collection of people, uh, but they orange pilled them. Just like every other person that's ever bought in Bitcoin. <laughs> every single person that has bought in Bitcoin has been convinced to join this community of like-minded people to take some of their hard earned wealth and trust it in this technology and community. It's not just the technology, right? 
We could have Adam's coin. We could hack the, you know, fork the Bitcoin blockchain and call it Adam's coin. And maybe your mother and your uncle would store some wealth there. I don't think uh, so. I don't even think they believe in Adam's right? coin, honestly. Mike. It's the social construct of it's people selling the story to each other. And so that's what's so unique about this. It is a, it is an active community. And the only way it grows is that people in the community figure out how they should contribute. Listen, there are a ton of free riders. I used to think I should put a tip jar on my Twitter because <laughs> <laughs> I'm out there preaching. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't get paid extra to preach, right? I own Bitcoin. Bitcoin goes higher. I make money. Uh, if I didn't preach, I'd still own Bitcoin. And so I always think it's essential for people to figure out how they can participate in that community. Again, they're free riders, but most people, you could be core developers, you could be, you know, or, or you could orange pull one person. But that's that's what this phenomena has been. I, I got to say the Larry Fink pivot on crypto has kind of caught me by surprise, both at how fast it's, it's happened. And if, if you're pointing to that as kind of a linchpin, uh, I'd be curious to dig into that. How do you think, like, how did that happen? How did he get orange pilled? Like, what was it? I, like, I, you know, I, a group of people sat with him, people that had a lot of his respect from other things they've done in life, sat with him and said, Larry, you're not thinking about this right. Let me explain to you why this is important. And what gets people in TradFi to understand is what's some, something that I think Satoshi must have seen. It's not in the white paper, but he must have seen it, right? Post 08, what came out of 08 in the reaction was a move to populism, right? What was the reaction in 08? It was bail out the hedge fund guys, bail out the insurance companies, and oh, we're gonna have a lot of people lose their houses. Hmm. And so if you're a little guy, you're like, this system's no fair. That's the beginning of saying, screw this, screw the system, screw the system. And Satoshi's paper was a screw the system paper. Uh, and it's like, we don't trust the system. Populism is coming. So what does populism end up being in political terms? It means I'm going to spend more and I'm going to spend more and I'm going to spend more. Donald Trump was the first populist par president we've had in my lifetime, right? We had neoliberal politics. George Bush, Bill Clinton, their policies were really damn similar. Donald Trump was like spending. And then Joe Biden came in and kind of hijacked by the progressives. He's like, I got to spend more. I got to get people pay off medical debt, pay off college debt. Right. And so we've had this reckless spending since 2016. There's no end in sight. And so when you're Larry Fink, you say, if you're going to see dollar after dollar after dollar printed, it's going to debase the dollar and let me buy something like gold or silver. Bitcoin is just digital gold. And I've always believed we should keep the, the story that simple. It's not going to be payments. It's not going to be just digital gold. We're not going to buy our tennis shoes in Bitcoin, right? Because we think it's going higher. Who's going to buy your tennis shoes in something you think is going higher? But if it's, it's a place that average Americans and average Sudanese people and average Egyptian people can take some of their hard-earned wealth and store it and feel like it's safe because they trust this code and they trust this community. It's not just the code. It's the community that participates in the code. And I think that's, you know, one guy told him that he brought in experts and, and Larry met with a lot of smart people, including people at his own firm, and said, I get it. And he's also very good at reading the, you know, reading the, the, the tea leaves. You know, hey, if this is going to be important, BlackRock needs to participate. And so all of a sudden, they, they help credentialize, right? My hope with Galaxy was always that we'd be a credentializer, hmm. uh, that we'd pick the right projects, that people would trust us, and that would bring people into these ecosystems. What, what do you mean by that, credentialize? Is it just give legitimacy? Give legitimacy. To, yeah, okay. And so listen, I have, I have bet on some projects that have sucked uh, and that, you know, does not do good things for my reputation. And I've been on some <laughs> projects that have been great. Sure. And that does better things, right? I bought Ethereum at one. Uh, a little bit lucky. Uh, <laughs> nice. A little bit, you know, it's not buying things, it's cheap. It's knowing when to sell them and when not to sell them. Hmm. Uh, that makes you the money. And, but that was the whole reason we set this company up because, you know, I was already old and I was already wealthy. So I said, when I go back to work, I want to be able to contribute to a community. So I thought I had something to add. Uh, I want to work with young people, a lot of young people in the space, and I want to learn new stuff. And it's an unbelievably 
diverse field. And so if you're not curious, you shouldn't be in the crypto field. It, it seems like part of what you're describing with Larry Fink and all of the kind of the other investors and now even pre presidential uh, nominees kind of you know, coming over into the, the crypto camp, it seems to be a tipping point. We just hit this tipping point. It's not just any, it's not just one thing. It's a confluence of factors that have allowed us to achieve it. When you look at 2017, when he used to say the herd is coming to now 2024, we are like, I guess, seven, seven years later on that journey. What is different about crypto? Yeah, we've hit this, this tipping point. There's more legitimacy. In what other ways is it different from 2017? Like, do we now have the infrastructure necessary? Like, were there some, was you know, there some building that's, that's occurred? Some, but so the big, you know, catalytic change was COVID because COVID created the political situation to pump trillions of dollars into the economy, trillions of dollars. And that allowed the story of, oh shit, we're gonna debase the currency to take hold globally. And so without COVID, we are, you know, we're trading 6,000, you know? <laughs> uh, like, I don't know what we're trading. We're trading a lot lower and the, and the energy didn't come into the space. COVID brought the energy into the space. I, I would not have gotten into this if it was just about Bitcoin. If it was just, hey, we're going to create an alternative to gold, a digital gold, that's just a lot better for a lot of reasons. I was always drawn to the space because this idea that really Vitalik, right? Uh, hey, we can not just put money on this blockchain, but we can put smart contracts and then we can put anything on. And, and so I always think Satoshi and Vitalik as my two heroes of this space. Like, I don't know who Satoshi is. I know who Vitalik is. And I think he's, he's just awesome. Uh, the way he's held himself, the way he's comported himself. Uh, my favorite guy in the whole space. Hmm. Um, I don't know him well. I met him a few times, but I just watch him. And I'm like, dude, that guy is so wise and so young. But he really gave this idea. You know, Joe Lubin's my friend. It was a college roommate. I went to his company and I was like, how can we use this technology to really revolutionize and make the world fairer? How can we connect people around the music space to cut out the middleman, ticketing, finance, all these different areas? And that is starting to happen. It hasn't happened yet, right? It's happening in a great way in payments, right? With rise of stable coins. We're investing a bunch of different payment, you know, companies, cross-border payment stuff. Um, that's, I think, really exciting. And there are some test cases around tokenization. Uh, we tokenize the violin. We're working on, again, a stable coin. It really hasn't happened in mass yet. And the rest of DeFi has been a crypto ecosystem play. What's really exciting in the next few years, we now have blockchains that are fast enough, trusted enough, stable enough that you're going to start seeing real world use cases built on them. But it's hard, right? If in 10 years time, it's Bitcoin and a casino. <laughs> We've all made a lot of money. I won't feel nearly as good about myself. I'd be like, oh my God, they spent the last chapter of my life building a casino. Uh, like, so for me, for this revolution to really be fulfilling, you've got to see blockchain-based ticketing. You've got to see blockchain-based finance. You've got to see blockchain-based music, uh, right? Giving the power back to the people, having peer-to-peer uh, relationships. And it's all about this community. And so that part is, is, is plumbing, right? It's getting the plumbing right. It's having the blockchains, uh, more robust. Uh, you know, it's funny. Blockchains are trust machines, but you've got to tr teach people how to trust the trust machine. It's actually, it's, it's a, it's kind of a, a messed up concept, right? Van Jones once won a big prize from Jeff Bezos and, uh, and he said, I got to spend this money. What can I do? And he thought, what about blockchain based voting? And I thought about it. I was like, dude, start with American Idol, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Like no one's going to trust blockchains on, on voting yet, even though me and you might show them the math that that's, that's a better system. So you got to, you got to bring people into the space where they can understand it and trust it. And at one point, all of it disappears into the back of the TV. Right. And so that journey for all of these other protocols and all of these apps that people are working on, it's literally in the first inning. Right. Bitcoin's in the in the sixth inning. Right. It's 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 just hit the main, you know, the majors. It's it's on its way. Right. Bitcoin's a finished product. Nothing has to change for it to be an awesome product. 
Uh, it's got a role in every portfolio in the world. Uh, but when's the last time you bought something on a blockchain? Like a, right? Yeah, you know, we don't even, in the US, we don't, we don't use blockchain-based payments because fucking Apple Pay works like a gem, <laughs> right? But if we lived in, you know, Venezuela or, you know, some parts of Africa, we'd be sending each other tether on Tron. To continue leveling up your crypto game, then you need to get on the Bankless newsletter. It's the world's most popular crypto email and is completely free. Just click below to sign up.